So what's the difference between bumblebees and carpenter bees? Now, carpenter bees are our largest bees here in North America. They're able to reach like around two and a half inches long and their sheer size alone lets them fly in weather that would simply blast other insects out of the sky. Carpenter bees pick up a lot of slack, just like bumblebees in early season, cold and inclement weather that would just keep other animals shivering in their shelter, waiting for the time to pass. Not only that, they're actually very long lived, especially for insects. A wide variety of especially our native bees only live for a few short fleeting weeks as adults. Carpenter bees have been found to live up to four years as adults. And interestingly enough, their first up to a year is normally spent actually inside their, their galleries or their nests. Uh, they're kind of housekeepers and kind of pest control duties. And so chances are the carpenter bees you see flying around your property are older than all other insects combined in your property. Now, the major difference between the two, carpenter bees are slightly larger than bumblebees, but again, remember the mantra, look to the butt. If you look to these bees, if you look at their abdomens, you can tell right away they're very different. Bumblebees almost always have a dense kind of afro, a dense profusion of hairs on their abdomen. Carpenter bees, on the other hand, almost never have hairs on their butt. They're always kind of black and shiny, and you can even almost tell them uh, just by when they fly, just kind of by their, their shiny abdomen. That's the major difference between the two. The other major difference is, of course, where they make their nests. Now, we've already gone over where bumblebees live, but carpenter bees, of course, live in wood, but they prefer to actually excavate their holes themselves. Their most common, uh, that scientists believe, nesting site in nature is actually a dead limb on a still living tree. And so these bees have developed the capacity to kind of leave that branch staying in place for quite a long time, even though they've made their nests in it. And to do that, what they do is actually they normally kind of burrow a perpendicular to the wood grain for about an inch or so as they're burrowing into new wood. Then after an inch, they make a right turn or a 90 degree turn, and the rest of their galleries, which can be up to six feet long, are bored in the direction of the wood grain. And what that does is it mimics a natural split in the wood and actually doesn't compromise the structural integrity at all, really. The real damage, mostly from carpenter bee nests, comes when predators like woodpeckers come to try to chisel out your new tenants. And so if you do see that woodpecker damage or you start to hear them cackling around your home, you can hang reflective markers or stickers. I've even heard if you heavily varnish the area and just so it has kind of that shiny effect, that can keep those birds away, which can really keep down on the damage that comes from these bees. These bees are also buzz pollination experts, just like bumblebees, but these carpenter bees are probably even more effective just through their, their size and their sheer beefy muscles. And just like bumblebees, these carpenter bees are able to warm themselves up quite a lot, both through shivering their muscles and scientists have found special enzymes around their muscles, which help them warm up at an even greater pace. And so again, these are critically important pollinators. They're also incredibly important food source, especially again in early spring and late fall, when many other insects are either departed or shivering in their holes. These bees are again, are feeding birds and amphibians and other animals in an environment. So the vast majority of times, it's much better to live and let live uh, and try to coexist with these animals, even if they're living in your house, because again, the benefits to environments that they have are legion. And it's important uh, when, you're, when we're talking about carpenter bees to think about their habitat in as much as basically our houses are kind of dead standing limbs and kind of a nicer looking package. I'd probably want to move into a house if I was a carpenter bee. And so the most important thing to do to foster these populations is to, of, of course, not step to the carpenter bee trap or the spray when you see them. And just like a lot of these other wood nesting bees, maintaining areas of natural dead wood, especially those dead limbs on a tree, will really foster these populations and will slowly get them to move from your house into their more natural areas. Now, here's another great picture of a carpenter bee nectar robbing. You can see its huge beefy jaws really getting into the base of this flower. 
And you can see on the front, or kind of the forehead of this bee, it has a giant yellow dot. And that's pretty important for carpenter bees, because that will normally tell you if it's a male or a female. Now, the males tend to have those large yellow dots on their forehead, and carpenter bee males uh, lead pretty entertaining lives. Basically, they stake out a 10 by 10 space, and they kind of choose that as their own. And once they've chosen a territory, they patrol that territory constantly. They challenge almost every organism that enters its space, trying to get it out. And so you, these bees, if you do enter their territory, they will get right up in your face, but the worst that you'll get from them is a curious headbutt. All bees actually are unable, or all male bees, excuse me, are actually unable to sting. Their reproductive organs are actually modified stingers. And in the vast majority of times, just like, say, when a honeybee stings and its abdomen detaches and it dies, the same thing happens to most male bees after they reproduce with a female. So I guess it's a good way to go, but it's, it's normally a terminal life, sen or a life sentence as they reproduce. But these bees, again, just like bumblebees, can recognize both bee and human faces. These carpenter bee males will get to know you. The more you enter their space and you don't challenge them, the less they'll bother you, and eventually they'll just start following you around kind of with a curious buzz. And one other thing uh, to kind of keep in mind is these bees, again, are incredibly, incredibly docile. Normally their large size will kind of scare people away from getting too close, but the vast majority of times, uh, even the, the kind of curious males will, again, give you a respite if you do seem uh, kind of stressed out by them. One other important thing about these males is studies have found that these carpenter bees will even bully animals down to the size of a mosquito, and they found that mosquitoes are less prevalent in and around heavily occupied carpenter bee areas. So if you found that you've got a lot of carpenter bees this year but not a lot of mosquitoes, you can thank your bee friends for that. Now, like we were talking about with restrictive blooms, now, of course, it's only natural that as plants and animals in an area lived together, especially for hundreds of millions of years, many of them developed close relationships. And many of our, many of our native plants and animals not only help each other, but they actually can only survive or operate at their peak efficiency if they've got their kind of favorite plants and animals living around them as well. Now, this is a great example of a very specialized bloom. These bottle gentians are basically already fully opened. And they've actually basically developed the capacity to keep out all other pollinators besides their favorite bumblebee pollinator friends. And so bumblebees are some of the only bees that are actually strong enough to pry their way into these blooms and actually pollinate their blossoms itself. And just like with nectar robbing, Sometimes smaller animals, especially smaller pollinators like bees, will follow around these juggernauts throughout a, you know, a very restrictive uh, kind of area, and they'll kind of wait for the bee to get into the flower, and they'll sneak in themselves. And sometimes they'll be left to kind of wait for the next large bee to enter uh, to kind of let them back out. Uh, but again, uh, a lot of our native plants are very specialized and really only prefer our native bees. Another great example of this are azaleas and rhododendrons. And now, Azaleas and rhododendrons actually take it a step further. They're not like physically restrictive like this. They're chemically restrictive. A lot of our azaleas and rhododendrons and some mountain laurels have poisons that are actually coursing through their nectar. A lot of our native bees have developed the capacity to live with. And so they're able to feed on them. But say, for example, if a non-native honeybee were to feed on a lot of our native rhododendrons and azaleas, it probably wouldn't even make it to back to the hive. That's how dangerous those, those poisons are to the bees. Now, interestingly enough, there are some rhododendrons that uh, have developed or that evolved in the Mediterranean, which is one of the areas that honeybees evolved in. And so honeybees do have the ability to feed on those Mediterranean rhododendrons. And interestingly enough, the honey that they make from that is known to have hallucinogenic and other kind of untoward properties. And you know, there are actually several accounts of ancient Romans actually kind of trapping uh, opposing armies by leaving hordes or stores of that, they used to call it mad honey, kind of in areas and to trick an opposing army to eat the honey, then they'd ambush them when they were feeling its effects. And so uh, it's, it's got quite a storied history, but uh, we don't have much of that honey here because again, most of those poisonous plants here, uh, European honeybees simply can't gather uh, in effective quantities.